just to get on the same page, you started here with your IP, and then you put in your IP here. And then you have to do add stream. So this should be your IP. So this is the port that the app is listening on. And embedded inside of it is a servlet essentially that's uh, producing uh, the or like JSON data that's powering this thing. So you guys are not seeing this, is that correct? Okay, so it's probably, if this is all going, if you guys could try to run one of these predictions using the REST service, so put in your IP. So go to your browser and just run this. So this is the sample data that's been seeded, so you should actually get a result. If you're getting a result, uh, typically, if you're seeing something that says no data right now, or uh, it's because it like literally has not received any data, so it's not generating. Um, I'm going to be doing like a, a pretty uh, what I think is a sweet blog post. Um, uh, some of this stuff as well, like the, the batching, um, yeah, getting histrix going. It's kind of the first time machine learning and Netflix OSS have uh, come together, so I'm pretty excited about it. And then, of course, the incremental stuff as well. But So basically, all of this stuff that, that happened after us manually going through the notebook, this is all kind of, we're the first people to see it, and we're just excited to show it. Um, I got some feedback uh, that I, I, the way I interpret it is I think I'm confusing a lot of people by mixing the sort of manual way of going through the notebooks with this um, sort of incremental and then this like, Netflix stuff. So probably don't want to spend too, too much time on this, but I wanted to, if you guys can get this going here, this, yes, are you seeing this come back with any, this should come back with a, with a number like 0.99 or something. Right? Yeah. Is the historic side of things showing up then after that? I spammed the reload to yeah. get some stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, at first I was like, maybe it's there, and then like reload a bunch. And yeah, then see it gets stuck a little bit sometimes. Okay. Um, so yeah, based on some of the feedback, I think I wanted to just kind of run this uh, by you guys. Like, do you want to go through the notebooks from the demo? Sort of step by step and see, like I, I, I kind of brushed through, like here's you know pulling data from Cassandra, here's where we're running um, like ALS and that kind of thing. So we're basically backtracking to the main demo, um, you know, which is us going through manually running, like generating the recommendations. Um, Um, one goal that I want for you guys for this, um, or like the end of this workshop, is to just kind of have the the place and, and role for some of these tools. There's you know so much out there. Um, yeah, I've been told by um, a few different people that if they were to start a project today, they would start like pretty much with this stack, right? Um, We've talked a lot about you know these different technologies and uh, Presto and things like that. Um, so this is sort of the entire environment. This is everything you could possibly ever do with this environment right now. And then this is kind of the demo uh, flow through it, except I threw in this real-time stuff uh, probably a little bit pre-baked, yeah, half-baked, but. Um, Oh, 
Oh yeah, so just knowing kind of like where these tools fit in, how they come together. Uh, at lunch, someone asked me about specifically Logstash, like I, uh, yeah, I mentioned Logstash and helping um, the notebook environment. So this is an example, um, yeah, Logstash configuration just straight out of pipeline slash config. These are all the uh, directories here that are being monitored. And then what you would do is then go into uh, Kibana and set up search filters and filter by um, the Zeppelin logs, have a ton of info in there. Um, and then of course the Spark logs, the Kafka logs, things like that. Okay, so, um, okay, one last. We'll do Presto later. We'll get through the notebooks and then um, I'll show you guys a demo. Presto is similar to Impala. Yeah, if you guys are familiar with that, where it's sort of a read, it's a query optimized, it's you know read optimized. What I'm starting to see in um, the Bay Area is probably like more and more people using Presto for what they thought they could use Spark SQL for initially. Right? Spark Spark itself is a Really generalized framework used for a lot of different things. Um, it's not tuned for read-only. Uh, you know, it's tuned for if a node fails, right? Like how is it going to recover? Things like that, right? These like long-running queries, maybe they're like iterative machine learning queries. If you're just doing straight up, right, like the whole ad hoc analytics, like throughout the day, uh, right? Like Presto is is uh, it's yeah badass. The problem with, with Riley Presto is if you lose a node, that whole query dies. So you don't want to go to bed expecting those results the next morning and wake up to find out that one node died. Right? But again, that's how they can optimize uh, and be faster than Spark SQL, for example, at, at uh, certain use cases, right? So, yeah, like one thing about Databricks Spark community, they do not like benchmarks, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay away from any kind of hard benchmarks, but um, yeah, I mean, everyone I know that is using Presto, they use it because it's faster at the end of the analytics. Um, Titan's a graph database. Not going to talk about it today because I can't get it to work. Um, it, yeah, does anyone use Tachyon? Oh, do you? Actually, read out of Kafka, which is pretty interesting. It's the, it's the first time I've personally seen anything able to read um, from a live Kafka queue, like in a, a queryable manner. Um, if you want to poke around while we're, if you do, I think Explore Services. I have Presto, yeah, Presto plus Kafka. So I've got this convenience script here um, that just kind of loads up all the dependencies, and you can actually query live. So this is the same ratings Kafka topic that when you click things, you know, it's going to that, that Kafka topic. Um, this thing right here. So Presto, you can actually query this directly through speed. So like, this is one of those cases where I wouldn't even have to wait until Spark Streaming gets it and then processes it and dumps it into S3 or dumps it into Parquet, uh, which is a file format. Um, I could actually go directly to the Kafka yeah, so right here, like here's, I mean, this is just a, a, a general select, but yeah, you could definitely, if you wanted to sort of, um, uh, what's the term, sort of, you know, laser in on, on a, a single user or a single uh, And so what, what I want you guys to come away with is, okay, like maybe you don't fully understand, I mean, this is taking me two years to build and you know, conceive and I think about it every day and uh, 
yeah, over I go. Um, at least you'll you'll hear like some some use case, or you know maybe you'll be talking to your coworkers and be like, oh, I, I think we talked about that in the class. Let's go look at, at the at the code, at the sample code. And you could literally just go in here, and I, I don't know if you can search the wiki very easily, but if you search, you know, Presto in here, just kind of look at everything related. Here's the configuration. Uh, you know, your head kind of goes, well, there was this Kafka thing. Oh, okay, here's the Kafka, um, and then this is how you configure it here. Kind of back into how it's done, <clears throat> and then people suggest things um, like yeah, I'll be talking to people after uh, you know, and they'll say different uses. Like that's how I found out about the Kafka Presto integration. I didn't know you could read off that. Like that's that's badass. And someone's like, yeah, man, we, that's that's how we can carve out certain uh, people. So I wouldn't build it. Um, you were asking about PMML. Uh, yeah, I know you have to leave or want to leave or whatever. So. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah. Uh, does anyone, so PMML is predictive markup modeling language. Have you guys used this? Yeah, who's, who's using PML in some context? Not obviously Java. EMR, the other EMR, the one that's been around for like, uh, yeah, longer than me, longer than anyone here. Um, yeah, apparently uses PMML, uh, the health uh, record EMR. So, yeah, let's talk about PMML in a bit. This is actually kind of a, a sticky point within Spark. Um, Spark community typically has not been very open to PMML. Uh, you know, I think it's not only the XML part of it, which I don't know why people always get hung up on XML, but uh, it, yeah, it's just kind of bloated, I guess. But um, also, so just recently, there's been this JPMML. Uh, there's someone kind of took over this project. Uh, if you search GitHub JPMML, and the, so this is the Java version of it, of the specification. Um, this person has this company, Open Scoring. I'm just going to spend a minute on this here. Uh, Open scoring is basically uh, a way from Spark, so picture this, you train your model, right? kind of map it back to our exact use case here. We would train the model, we find like a decision tree. Up to the end, just to show you guys. So, you would train the model, you get this decision tree, right? Like, now what do you do with it? Right? Like, how do you actually like, productionize this thing? To put it behind a web service so that I can pass in data, get back the classification or whatever data I'm passing in. So, uh, PMML comes in handy because you can, you, you should anyway be able to just call to PMML, and that's going to output. You know, a, a string of uh, this big, like honking XML thing that can represent all these split points, right? Decision trees are just a bunch of if statements. If this feature is less than this, greater than that, boom, 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 here's the prediction. So that can very, very easily be uh, like represented within XML. It's kind of you know bloated and all that. The, the spec is crazy. Um, yeah, they use weird terms for things, or yeah, at least weird to me. Um, so yeah, the ability to do 2PMML and then to take that string and actually deploy it, you can deploy it to this open scoring. Um, yeah, one of my buddies works at uh, the company HomeAway, which is kind of like a uh, really Airbnb kind of thing. Yeah, so they use open scoring. That was actually the first time I heard about this and then I backed into, so this is a bunch of like REST web services and things like that where you can deploy models so yeah, here's the REST API. So like, picture this world where you've built the model with Spark, you have this string that you can now pass and uh, actually create like a REST endpoint to use that, that model for scoring. 
or for the inference, people call it, right? So, yeah, pretty powerful stuff, and then you can inspect each of the models, things like that. So, uh, yeah, open script. The thing that we talked about at, at uh, our like lunch just a minute ago was some of the licensing around this is, has changed since this new person, uh, really Vilu, took over. Um, I've been emailing with him, sounds like he's been uh, sending him emails as well. It's kind of funny, he's like one dude that's like taking over this whole project and totally, I mean, the code is awesome. I think it's awesome. It's like how I would think and it's um, right, like laid out well, commented really well. Like you can tell he spent a lot of time on this stuff. But uh, yeah, just trying, I you know, wish someone big would just buy him and uh, free the license up, but um, you have to pay money essentially to use some of these things. But so now this is interesting too. So here's a Spark binding for it. So you can take your Spark output and like literally call 2pmml and then get the string. Here's uh, scikit-learn. So you can be um, convert scikit-learn models into pmml. This is a Java library for that. That's weird. Scikit-learn 2pmml. Here's a Python library to take. So from your actual scikit-learn, uh, you can take your um, probably models called 2pmml and then deploy them. Yeah. And the older version that doesn't have this new license. Uh, yeah, the old. It, it was, wait, so it like, used to be the Apache 2 license, and then they. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So I've, I've been trying to use the older one that yeah. doesn't have a new license. What's the other? Um, is it like Zementus? That, yeah, I remember I did a project a few years ago where we were building actually something very similar to this open scoring. Which is actually, by the way, what Pipeline IO is doing. So yeah, this guy's like my main competitor. Just funny, it's me versus him. I have to fly out to Estonia, take this guy on you know, one on one. Uh, yeah, Zementus is kind of the first time I ever heard about uh, these tools, and I don't even know do they have a Spark. Yeah, there's no, no result coming back here. But yeah, I know these guys charge. Yeah, and so just for context, the Spark community um, isn't really into the whole PMML thing, so there was a, a tiny bit of PMML support that was introduced, uh, and it, it was using some of this stuff before, but again, now that the version has changed and the licensing has changed, it, it's no longer there. So um, The way that Spark currently exports models is using Parquet. It's a total proprietary form. I mean, Parquet itself is not a proprietary file format, but the way that they're storing is a proprietary format, right? Like the structure of the parquet. Um, so actually, I mean, I've been kind of waiting for someone to create, like, uh, you know, Spark, Spark PML kind of thing or whatever, where they can actually just go into the parquet and uh, build models off that. Um, one note about, yes, I know I'm kind of digressing a little bit here. There's this decision tree, so picture this. Imagine this world, um, and this is something I'm, I'm currently working on as well. This is one of my current uh, Jira's issues, whatever. Is the ability to take this model, and if you're really given the, the parquet or some sort of representation, um, this is why I started looking at the JPMLs because I wanted a string representation of this tree, and I suppose I could use this uh, debug statement here, which is just you know, calling two string. If you can convert this into and do code generation, right? So you can actually generate Java code or generate C code um, off of this. I mean, this is just a big if statement, right? It's just a bunch of nested ifs. So started kind of hacking up some of this. Uh, let me see how much I have time to show. Yeah, so. So code generator. I'm using this tool called Genino, which is used internally by Spark. So one of the other things that came out of Project Tungsten and was, was further refined in Spark 2.0 um, is uh, taking your, your right, like logical plan from your SQL or your, your HiveQL. So Spark SQL, like you're in there, you know, joining, doing things like that. Um, which ends up being, you know, a map, a map, a reduce, a filter, blah, blah, blah. 
and taking all that and fusing as much together as you can. So that, think of it from a JVM perspective. If you're calling multiple functions, you have to go up the virtual function tree and down and you know, do all these kind of things. That's how Spark, Spark used to work. Um, now it can take a look at that right, like overall query plan and fuse together these methods. Like literally take what they're trying to do, which would, which would have been three or four map calls, and fuse them together and physically create, and this is on the fly and cached, of course, for like later use, physically create one uh, like method call that does all three or four of those things. So this is huge. It's huge from a performance standpoint. This is why you see Spark 2.0 as you know two or ten times the, uh, the performance of Spark you know, 1 and 6 and all that. It like cracks me up when, when new uh, right, like performance benchmarks come out about Spark because you're like, really? Was that shitty before? Like, where, you know, like Spark streaming, I think. It was Spark streaming 1.6 or whatever. And like, yeah, it's you know 35 times faster than it used to be. Like, is 35 is that slow? Like, yeah, why does anyone use it? But it's 35 percent or times better, so that's good. So here's just kind of a quick glimpse. But if I'm given these split points, which is stored in the parquet itself, right, and it's this, 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 you know, less than greater than, I can actually generate this code. So I'm, I can generate on the fly um, a Java method or a class that gets that gets compiled on the fly. So. Yeah, picture like this huge cluster of like model servers, right, where they're serving out Spark models. And they get notified through dynamic configuration. You would see this prediction service kind of scroll across and actually pull something in instead of just continuing to uh, not find anything. It would find this new model and then dynamically generate the code and boom. Now I've got a fully optimized, it's just like a poger, right? It's a plain old Java object with an if state. Or if you're in a C environment, if you don't trust Java, uh, you could generate secret, just to be interesting. Okay. Yeah, so that's the code generation stuff, uh, PMML. What, I was looking at the PMML stuff because this person is going through, he's already done the heavy lifting from the parquet stuff, which is the shit I didn't want to write, it was actually going into the parquet, and uh, He's sort of interpreting the model based on the parquet, so he's not compiling it. Uh, he's just kind of pulling it out, and he's got his own little sort of runtime. It's totally, you know, it's it's uh, it's really object everywhere. Like there's no type, there's you know, very little typing. It's just kind of his own little um, interpreted language, which is uh, great in that it's generic and it, and it works. But there's definitely uh, faster ways to do it. So. That's going to be kind of my, my in with this guy is, hey, if you give me the license for free, I'll <laughs> help extend it with some of this code generation stuff. So. Okay. All right. Um, let's go through this guy. So what do you guys have to do to get, you would have to be running so make sure, so kill this train MF incremental. We'll only spend about maybe 20 minutes on this. We'll just blaze through the code. Make sure train MF incremental is killed in your port 6060. Port 6060 here. And then let's go out to the command line. You can uh, kill whatever you're currently. So yeah, one thing that you guys notice is that to do the first demo this morning, um, where we did the manual way, we didn't need the Netflix stuff. And it's because I've, I've been sort of moving everything over, but there's too many moving parts, so I, I kept that, that demo back on the old, uh, talking directly to us. Okay. Alright, and do you start Spark Street on this H. You can run that from anywhere because it's been mounted on the path. And then you could do tail spark streaming. Okay. 
This is what um, I think a lot of you had working um, when you were charging ahead. Uh, I do want to just go through and step through some of the code though and make sure you guys know. Because this is kind of the crux of what I want you guys to go with is how these things come together. Alright, so we know we've started this spark streaming right here, this Kafka Cassandra thing. This is off of the architecture overview on the zero width sidebar element. This is the entire world, and then right below it is the uh, demo world. So we start Kafka Cassandra, that should be running. Refresh Kafka Cassandra. Cool. Now, if you go back here and you start clicking, you should see stuff. This is our success criteria. I'm passing in demo here because, or the uh, host name, I think for you guys it'll be the IP. Because in the Spark streaming code, which we're going to look at, I'm using that for the geo resolution. Yeah, so everyone got there? Everyone's already gotten there? Fine. Yeah, just do, it's, it's the exact same, just uh, replace start with tail. So tail dash arc dash db. And this you can run from anywhere. Spark streaming, start dash spark dash streaming and then tail. These two right here. So yeah, just make sure that when you click here that you're seeing stuff popping up there. That means it's ending up in uh, Cassandra. Now, what we can do, and actually, control C out here. <laughs> Let me verify that everything shows up. Control C, and let's do CQLSH. Take a look at your user ID, which come, which is off of the main home page. One, one, so yeah, mine is 11510. And so right now we're using the uh, uh, Cassandra uh, CQL command line. So CQL is Cassandra query language. And we're going to use, I think the name of the database is Advanced Spark. We're going to do select star from item ratings where user ID. I'll keep this up. I'm not going to run it. Should put semicolon after it. That is okay. Get into CQLSH. So this is how you verify, and then if you go click some more and run it again, you should see more people. Um, just 
just give you guys an idea. This user ID, actually, I think if you highlight over it, it'll show you the, the, down in the bottom left, the JavaScript call shows you, that's the actual item ID of that, of that first person. And so women start with 9,001, men start with 1,001. Where we are in the overall flow is we've got Spark streaming running, pulling off of this Kafka queue and sticking it into Cassandra. CQL SH and then you would do use advanced spark and you would do select star from item underscore ratings where user ID equals your user. probably see Mountain View and things like that because this is actually uh, the Google servers. It's the IP of the uh, Google, not, not our IP here in Seattle. Okay, so that's kind of fun. Um, break out of here. We're going to do one more cool thing here. We're going to actually inspect the Kafka topic. We should see the same data. So, yeah, just in case you're uh, wondering where I'm at, I'm on. I put these in here because I forget the commands all the time. I'm under. Number five on the wiki. And there's a whole ton of stuff in here that you probably have maybe already gone through on your own. Oop, actually, it's number four. Yeah, so number four, the Explore Services. So one thing we can do, we can take that first, we can actually call into Kafka itself and say, hey Kafka, uh, tell me where do I, what, what do you know about, and here's item ratings right here. So I'm just kind of going top down here and seeing what's interesting, but we'll get to the, oh yeah, here's my favorite. All right, like, do you guys know about the REST API, the secret REST API? The secret REST Spark submit yeah, API that's here. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, so there's this, this dude out of Berlin, I call him a snitch. Submit REST. I'm sure the Spark community did not like this coming out. So this guy, he was sitting down to learn Spark. And of course, what you do when you go learn a new tool, you, you go through all the logs, right? Um, when it's starting up, especially, right? Like, what is this thing starting? Like, show me what, 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 uh, and then you might go inspect the ports and figure out why is it starting. So, this dude realized that Spark was actually starting this, um, or like an embedded Jetty server or something. It was listening on a port 6066. Um, and he realized that it was this proxy into, it was a REST proxy into a Spark submit call. So, this would come up all the time at, at Databricks. People wanted to submit Spark jobs after, after, um, yes, after uh, 
right, like continuous integration type of scenario, continuous deployment, so they would, you know, this, this Spark app would build, it was successful, all the tests would pass, and no one's ever written a Spark test ever, I don't think, or a, a MapReduce test. Um, but yeah, let's just pretend that there are tests passed, and then they wanted some, some restful way to actually deploy this job. Um, and no one could do it. We would, you know, people would hack things together, they would, they would run all these crazy bash scripts coming out of Jenkins, things like that. So this is the first time, um, and so when, when asked, oh, and so things you can do, you can submit um, an app. And so this is the blog post behind it. Let me actually document it here. Yeah, so you can actually do this. This is Spark Pi if you want to take this command. So again, we're on the number four, Explore Services. Let's try to run it. You can run it from anywhere. It's been mounted on the uh, So this returns you this submission ID, and then from there, uh, I don't know this document person. I have the submit side. Well, actually, you can verify the submitted. You could go, let's see what we do. You would go to our IP address, yeah, the Spark admin, and it should show up in completed apps. So there we go. Spark Pi ran. You can get the results. This is the result, this is the sort of unique ID that you can then, you have to pull for, for the answer, or for the, the status. Yeah, it's a goofy model, and I'm not sure why I don't know this document. Yeah, it's, it's You guys, an idea where I'm at? PWD. So I'm at pipeline, bin, and there's a there's a ton of stuff. There's uh, this rest directory. So check job status. ideas of ground here to this thing is how I did it. Do we it? Thanks. So. the idea there. Um, when, when asked directly the Spark community, <laughs> the official word from the Spark community is that uh, this is a development API, it's experimental, it's every other thing of what you want to hear. Right? So one thing to notice, uh, this, this is not a secret, um, is there anything unusual or particularly uh, notable on the actual REST call itself? Anything interesting about this URL? Maybe from there over. And yeah, there's a version. So when you're versioning shit, you mean it for it to be around, right? And it, it's pretty. I think it's pretty safe to say that whatever mechanism or tooling has been built around this, like Databricks notebook, uh, it's probably not going to work. So feel free to use it, but don't get mad at me if it does change. So that's kind of fun. 
Right? Was that fun? Was that interesting? Yeah, who knew about that? Did anyone know about that? Yeah, how did you know about Someone found a need uh, to submit jobs from Rust. Um, yeah, I've seen some pretty hokey things going on. Um, trying to work around that, so that, that was actually kind of welcome. Uh, there's something called Spark Job Server. That's the, that's the closest thing that, that has come to this uh, particular. So there's two things. There's the, the Spark Job Server, which gives you the ability to make a Rust call. Uh, this project's been around forever. It has never been accepted into the Spark community. Um, but it's still in pretty heavy use. In fact, that uh, blog post actually does mention it. It talks about Spark Job Server. Um, what's cool about Spark Job Server, too, is it's, a, it's basically a proxy uh, that creates one Spark context. And then, because, right, like imagine chaining together multiple jobs. And one job is setting up a bunch of RDDs and sticking them into memory, and then the second job that comes from a different team wants to use that. That's you know it's part of a larger workflow. It wants to use that data that's in in the uh, cluster memory. There's no way to do that right now. Two separate jobs. Each job has its own Spark context. Every time a uh, Spark context dies or uh, the job ends, all of the pointers to those uh, RDDs around the cluster are gone. So Spark Job Server uh, that gives you the ability not only to submit, um, which is a nice feature from REST, but also the ability to reuse right, these like RDD uh, between jobs. Um, yeah, it's doing that by creating one physical Spark context, but when you, you know, go in, it, it's sort of, each job thinks it has its own context, but it can get to the shared state. Um, let's see. And then there's this other project by, I just want to highlight this, by Cloudera. It's called Libby. The downside to Libby, at least when I looked at it a couple months ago, is it, it only works with yarn. So if you're not a yarn shop, it's not going to be all that useful. But it's pretty much the same thing as Spark Job Server. Um, well, the Spark Job Server guys are probably different. But from my standpoint, it gives me the ability uh, to submit from a REST API and what else here. Yeah. So uh, this is a Cloudera Labs project, I believe. Anyway, yeah, so these are just use cases I want you guys to be aware of and ways to get around them. Or ways to implement them. Okay, so we just did this, we did CQLSH. Uh, yeah, Zookeeper is kind of interesting. Um, I was so excited about like Cloud Air, or yeah, about Kafka uh, 10, or like 0 0.10, um, because there was all this talk about Zookeeper was going away, right? So Zookeeper is still an integral part of Kafka. Um, it's just that when, when you are writing an app, you, the developer, don't have to worry about it. Uh, or like Zookeeper, like you don't have to keep passing it around. You don't physically, from your app, have to have ports open to the Zookeeper cluster. You're just submitting. Um, so Kafka basically is using itself, you know, for certain for the things that used to it, it used to use uh, like Zookeeper for, but like publicly, yes, internally it still has to use Zookeeper for the distributed coordination and things like that. So it's still needed. It's just it's less uh, visible if you're writing like a you know, producer consumer for for Kafka. Um, yeah, MySQL. If you guys want to kind of dig in here, this is where the high meta store lives. Uh, for those of you that that don't know, um, so yeah, I basically went the last like year and a half without needing the high meta store. Um, like the, the physical Java process that's known as the Hive Meta Store. Spark, if you don't have a Hive Meta Store, you can set up just like a raw MySQL and have
have Spark point to it, and Spark can simulate what is normally done by the, the, the full high metastore process and you know full, uh, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so all this time I actually thought I was using the high metastore, but I was really using a shortcut that Spark gives you, Spark SQL gives you, that simulates the high metastore. And all it's doing is creating a table in here. Uh, um, high metastore's sole purpose is to maintain uh, if, you know, right, like this directory on disk contains log files, right? Let's say they're Apache log files that are well formatted. And here's the schema that, right, that matches uh, this sort of unstructured or you know, semi-structured data. So that's what the high metastore does. Um, what's interesting, uh, right, like data breaks, we, we're working with this one customer. Um, it's a pretty uh, like popular gaming site. And their Hive Metastore was so large, because they had so many, they were partitioned, yeah, so this maintains partitions of your data, you know, so think of, yeah, I was describing Netflix and logs earlier, and said that uh, these logs were partitioned every 15 minutes, and it still took an hour for these queries to run, even over a 15 minute block of time. Uh, so, yeah, that's what the Hive Metastore does, is it says this subdirectory is for this quarter hour, and then, you know, this subdirectory is for that quarter hour, boom, boom, boom. Um, and then lets you query, and so, right, like whenever you do a Spark SQL query, it first has to query this MySQL database to say, oh, I'm, I'm trying to find you know, this and pull out the schema and you know, really validate it and things like that. So this particular right, like customer had so many partitions that this was the, the like actual bottleneck, right? Like querying this Hive Metastore took longer than the actual query itself on, you know, on disk. So, how do you fix right, like slow databases? Well, you partition. So they actually for so they uh, yeah so they work directly with uh, the right, like open source guys at Databricks who sat right next to them like this little big customer that's helped us out. Um, this actually has come in handy probably quite a few times. So the actual high metastore table itself is now partitioned, and uh, you can get to these quarter hour right, that, like metadata very very quickly now versus a full table scan for example. Um, you'll see that in some of the Spark configurations. It's a sort of advanced stuff, but if you're wondering, like, there's this Hive Metastore or, or Hive Partition thing, that's actually different than what you as the Spark SQL developer would be thinking about in terms of partitions. Where you're thinking about partitioning your data, this is actually partitioning that, that table. Uh, yeah, oh, so I finally had to reintroduce, or I had to introduce the Hive Metastore service as it's known, the Java process. Uh, Presto uses the Hive Metastore service. So when I added Presto to the stack, um, it, it was having none of this shortcut business that uh, Spark is all about. Real quick, because I keep talking about it. Let's do. Let's query this Presto. I'm not even following my own uh, like advice to go through the notebooks right after. <laughs> I just keep rambling. Okay, so here, so I've got this convenience thing that just sets up some of the. and that kind of stuff. So here, I'm actually, I'm going to do, so I'm inside of Presto, but I, it's been configured to use Kafka, and it's been told where the Kafka server is. So here, I'm, I'm actually querying what's in. So right, like Kafka stores the you know, last X number of hours or whatever you want to uh, configure it to. Actually, that's one drawback with Kinesis. Is it still 24 hours? Do you know? With uh, like Kinesis, yeah, because like Kinesis didn't didn't used to go beyond. So, what was always a risk was if you had an outage and there was data stored in Kinesis and you were scrambling to get it get your shit working, and then you if if that window to get it fixed was longer than 24 hours, you would actually lose data on the Kinesis side because that that data would fall off. So I think they bumped it. I think and I'm sure for like larger customers they'll figure it out. Yeah, it might be 48 hours. Uh, the other drawback with Kinesis, too, um, was the payload size. 
used to only be 50K, I think. Whereas Kafka, I can put the payload message size can be anything, right? It can be like whatever I uh, configure it for. Um, recently, yes, Amazon, I think even like maybe a year ago now, it's probably not that recent, but they, I think they bumped it up to one meg. Yeah, I mean, we had stack traces at Databricks that were larger than 50K, so, and that's what we were trying to push through the data pipeline was any errors that came out of the commands and the notebook and things like that. Um, so if I do, I should be able to do a where. So it's the same thing I did in Cassandra, right, that, that we did in Cassandra. You can actually run that command and do where sliced and diced them, went after one specific customer. This is huge. Like the ability to go, I mean, think of kind of sifting through. Yes, I remember there was this uh, um, this huge like VP or whatever at like Netflix, and he couldn't, he finally came to our team and was like, I can't figure out why my prediction is screwed up. Like, they're way screwed up. Something's wrong with all of Netflix. Jump on it. So we were trying to slice and dice and go through logs and run hive queries and we had the guy's customer ID, right? And, like, we had his account ID and everything. And we literally, things he was telling us, just like, we're not matching. He's like, yeah, you guys uh, they suggested one movie and then not the other. Uh, it turns out it, his partner, um, I can't remember if they lived together at the time, but uh, changed it over to his account. So this is back before you could have multiple profiles. And, and so like, physically on the Xbox, changed the account. And but if it like, wasn't noticeable, you just log in. Um, yeah. And so it, it turns out it wasn't a bug with Netflix, it was just a user error. But like, we spent like three days on it because this guy could fire us at any moment, you know? But, yeah. Um, well, partition, all of the keys, um, if you're looking for a particular key, it's definitely going to be the same partition. Because right? all, all keys will be stored on the same That begs the question, you should be careful how you partition. Yeah. Can you slice that data, like the way that you have to there? Is that automatic? Can you slice whatever your top of the line is? Yeah, like, can you, I guess, kind of the broader question is can you, like, provide a schema or something for this? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I remember trying, I remember thinking through that, and I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna use underscore key and underscore message. Um, I don't know. Just kind of thinking through it, yeah, because you could have some sort of UDF or something like that within Hive where it would split it up, you know, the comms separated, and pull out the first, second, third elements, whatever, but I, yeah. Like there's a whole uh, section on Presto and Kafka. Off the so the, this query is not interacting with the Hive Metastore? Um, it, it's, oh, that's a good, the question is, does this particular query require the Hive Metastore? And where does the Hive Metastore even fit in here, right? Um, because I think the reason I was using the Hive Metastore, I, yeah, that's a good question. I know that the uh, uh, Hive Store is used if we do... Yeah, yes, I don't know why the Hive Store. Right, right, yeah, so that's what I was about to show was if we do... Here's Presto and Hive.
Yeah, so I think the summary there is that uh, the Hive Metastore is not involved in the Presto flow. There's no reason for it to be. But let's show a reason it should be, Presto Hive. All right, so here's where we're going to compare, not in a performance way, not in a way that's going to irk the Spark community. All right, here's a gigantic query. I don't know why this has to be so big, but uh, this is on the step number four. So here's a picture of Hive here. Hive has spent more time on the sort of command line graphics than they, they do on like a UI. Um, so here, what am I doing? I'm selecting uh, from this movie table. I think this is the which data set? This is probably the M lens, the uh, movie lens. So what was interesting and surprising to me, because everyone keeps telling me how fast Presto is, is in this particular example, um, Spark SQL is actually faster. This is Spark 1.6, 1.6.1. So we'll run the exact same query. Right, so how long did that take? Uh, what was I doing there? I was finding the highest average rating, I think. I did, yeah. Yeah, I kind of mentioned that at the beginning that this uh, demo, or uh, this whole environment was very, very heavily dependent on Elasticsearch. And I still love Elasticsearch, right? I, mean, I don't think there's a single person I know that, that doesn't use it or hasn't played with it. Um, hearing more and more about, you know, just kind of working with like more and more customers about the real-time like, prediction layer things, you know, calling into or, like any database is just a bad idea. Like just cache everything, right? Like, cache the predictions, cache the the like user vector, the you know item vectors. And maybe even pre-process the results of those and cache those, right? So, and like the more and more I was starting to look into Tachyon and Luxio and these things and the sort of RAM disk concept. Um, yeah, man, Elasticsearch is fast. It's it's good, um, but I was using it specifically or rather mainly for the serving layer. So, would have been in terms of the architecture, um, would have been you know right next, be in kind of the middle left uh, for serving it up to the End users. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see a lot of S3, of course. Um, yeah. Netflix was like, very into that. They will swear up and down that there's no performance hit with S3, but. Yeah, I was like again trying to keep this as light as possible. And at the end, it's like we're going to do sort of where we all join into one cluster and process uh, the same data set. You know, we're going to process, we're going to generate recommendations off of the large, uh, right, like movie lens data set, which on a single node might you know take like a couple hours. Or yeah, we're going to work through it pretty quickly. Um, the way I can get away with that is that we all locally have the same files. So all the data sets have been loaded. So Spark is smart enough to know when it's been given the Hadoop RDD, or it's all called Hadoop RDD, yeah, even though it's a file system, uh, that here's the offset, and it's going to look on the file, the exact same file. Fortunately, it's the exact same file, and it's going to pull out. So I'm kind of cheating in that sense, but yeah. yeah. What was the use case for GFS? Um, I mean, at some point, when you have distributed processing going on, you need a shared file system of some kind, right? And um, the really downside of HDFS, obviously, is when you're writing, it's it's, it's going to replicate. You know? um, each each block goes to three different nodes and that kind of thing. Um, the downside to using S3 or some sort of external shared file system is that that like, latency of pulling things down, right? So, um, but yeah, again, Netflix swears up and down that they've done the you know, performance tests and uh, of doing like a local HDFS for all of the EC2 nodes are sharing this, the same file system um, or just pulling it from S3, which is a remote distributed file system. And it's slower, but it's not slow enough to where they, you know, the, rather 
management of a of this, you know, like an HDFS cluster. And like again, this stuff's not bad. Like right? like running a Kafka cluster is not that bad. But if you're running that and you're running, you know, five other things, like you have to kind of pick and choose. So if you can defer and just have S3 be the thing, so yeah. S3 has some like eventual consistency issues too. One cool thing about Netflix finally joining on the, the Spark bandwagon, right, like last year, um, is they were finally like, all right, yeah, right, we have to figure out how Spark uh, plus or like S3 work because like, they're very, very, um, right, like S3 and right, like Amazon heavy. Uh, they got Spark plus Yarn to work pretty well. Um, so they basically were trying to like run things even, I just saw this talk recently, even the Spark history server itself, um, the Spark history service maintains um, all the previous, oh, yeah, it's, it's not currently working. But the Spark history server itself, uh, you know, which is taking job information and storing it and things like that, was single thread, right, like up until uh, like Netflix got involved and they are like, I can't even see, I mean, there's so many jobs running throughout the day that, like, my job doesn't even show up in the history server for, like, 18 hours or something. So they finally cracked it open and realized it was single-threaded and they decided to go fix that. So, yeah, I mean, even from the Spark tooling to the Yarn support to the S3 support, um, yeah, lots of little, so in, I think the past year they probably submitted, like, 20 or 30 hardcore Jira patches, like real stuff, not just in the documentation and things like that. Um, okay, so this took how long? This took 59 seconds. Here's my disclaimer. This is not a valid benchmark. <laughs> do not do anything with this. What's interesting, in case you guys haven't uh, really thought really through things this way, but these like Spark Dash SQL and Spark Dash Shell. Like these are just long running or Spark apps, right? Just like Seth runs a long running app. So kind of interesting. They're more like Spark Stream than you would think, the way that they're, they're architected. Um, all right, so let's run this. Spark SQL, for example, uh, is faster for the ad hoc. Like that's what I'm starting to see. So there's there's ways to write your code that are either fault tolerant and somewhat slow, or they're blazing fast and can't can't deal with a failure, right? Because if you're dealing with failure, if, if I mean, right, like think of the person writing the Presto code versus the people writing the Spark SQL code, they have to always, you know, be like checkpointing and doing little tricks to be able to recover. And that, that slows down the, the, right, the happy path. Yeah, exactly. So, what time do you want to There are no breaks. <laughs> uh, 28 seconds. Isn't that crazy? Versus the minute, so it's almost. But again, I don't know how to tune Presto. Like, I barely know how to tune Spark, so I'm just happy to use faster. And this is Spark 1.6 too, I'd be curious to see too. Uh, sounds like we need a break. You guys need a break? Who wants a break? Yeah, did you get your shit working? Yeah, we're okay. yeah, sitting right next to Andrew too. He's the... Oh, really? Yeah. Um, let me actually, can I do one more thing before we break? And then we can. 
Has anyone used the Hive Thrift server in any context? The Hive Thrift server. So it's a it's a really goofy name for. Um, in the Spark context, it's a, a proxy that lets you do JDBC or like ODBC from your like Tableau client, for example, uh, and call into uh, Spark. So, and I think it's probably running. No, it's not. Let's break out of there. Yeah, so it looks like it's running. If you guys on um, step four, I have to make these more clear, um, but this is the command. So we're using this like command line. Uh, Hive thrift server client called DLine. So the Hive thrift server, the way that this is architected, which is very significant to know about this, is it's a single master password, right? So you, you, so like picture, there's you know ten data, right? like ten uh, BI guys that are trying to connect with their Tableau. You're all connecting to the same Hive proxy. So that's one problem. Uh, you know, single point of failure, all that stuff. But also what's happening is any results that come back have to be streamed through that, that single master. So yeah, if you guys know the limitations behind Redshift, it's the exact same thing. Redshift, when you're like designing your like queries and things for, for the Hyperf server or for Redshift, you want to defer as much of the, the like heavy lifting behind that master. If you start doing things in Tableau, if you start really pulling all the data through Tableau, uh, that's a single pipe that you're, you're also sharing with you know, 10 other people that are uh, trying to pull the same data, um, and then things just get really slow, which is kind of foreign to some you know, like Tableau users, like they want more data so they can slice and dice it. It's just not the way that, that these uh, tools are, are built. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. So we can do a, so we should be able to do like a show tables. So now this is, Oh, it's a connection with views. Okay. okay, so let me, I guess we have to start it up. So here's the command right before. Start dash hive dash thrift server. You run it from anywhere. Yeah, I would demo the uh, Tableau stuff, but they, my license keeps expiring and I refuse to pay for it. Okay, and that's connection with views too. Hmm, what's going on there? So yeah, you would have full access. Yes, any temp tables too that uh, like you create. Because um, how does this work? I think actually, I think as of Spark 1.6, you can have separate sessions, right? But before it was all uh, like one combined session. So I think you could create temp tables and then um, probably one job could create them and the other ones could create them, things like that. Yeah, more. More recently, I. Yeah. Oh, for you. I see. Yeah, for some reason it wasn't wasn't liking the flow here. Show tables. There's no tables. So do you guys have tables? I guess I don't have tables. I don't know what's up. Let's take a break and then we'll go through the notebooks. <laughs> we were supposed to do two hours ago.
for an hour ago. 10 minutes, 2.23. Anyone has real-time feedback and you're brave enough, please come up. You're very accepting of it. Yes? I, I tried uh, all capital with the semicolon. Oh, that works? <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. One more time. One more time, yeah. With the semicolon, too? Very good. What? <laughs> So this is actually the same, we, we could probably run that same query. So just return counts, just return aggregations, don't actually return everything you would expect. You need to do all this in uh, Tableau. 